so uh, I'd like to welcome to my podcast uh, this on this episode, I should say. It used to be weekly, no longer weekly. It's just whenever episodes come out. Um, um, I have uh, author uh, Jonathan Mayle on my show. He is the author of this book, Harlem World, uh, How Hip Hop S- Super... Ah, okay. try that again. I'm going to keep it in. We're going to try that again. <laughs> it's cool i'm gonna have to read it because i was reading it backwards um it's called harlem world um and it's uh how hip-hop super showdown changed music forever is the subtitle to that um and yeah it's uh it's a it's a an origin story if you will um of kind of part of the uh explosion that became hip-hop that we all know and love these days um back in the um early 80s uh late 70s early 80s where you kind of set this story um true story i should mind it's not like a fictional thing um but jonathan welcome to the show thank you so much for having me it's it's a thrill to be on i appreciate it excellent excellent well like i said beforehand i really enjoy reading this book um hip-hop uh to me obviously being british we kind of had it uh the exports sort of come over in the mid sort of 80s and so on um and we had our own sort of style electro um breaking and graffiti we had that whole movement here as well um but obviously the origin of all this is new york um and the influx of cultures in that area where you kind of set your book um like say we'll sort of go straight into the first couple of chapters really just kind of really sets the stage it was very um what's the word cinematic i think the word is what i'm looking for because it really felt like you immersed well you immersed the reader into this world um of the bronx and um harlem and and that sort of like what it was like back then blackouts such things like that um and um you know and and how hip-hop became this sort of street culture if you will um and how it was sort of you know how it well part of what how it became what it is today which is an empire um if you will um but yeah take take it take us back into sort of like your background on this like um what's what's your sort of origin as an author and things like that where do you sort of where is your sort of you know background yeah so i um i've always loved writing you know i I was my i was on my high school newspaper you know i was on my college newspaper um and i ended up freelance writing for i still do it but you know my heyday was like say between 2014 and like 2018 ish um, but at the same time, I've also been working as a high school teacher. But during COVID, I just, you know, I was one of those people that during COVID just kind of took a step back and evaluated things. And I just decided I wanted to take a year off and and write. So I settled on this topic because I love pop culture history, not just music history, but all pop culture history. Yeah. And uh, this is something that doesn't get written about. You know, this is most of the hip hop history books are like the history of hip hop from 1973 to today. Yep. And I didn't want to really do that. I wanted to kind of do like a what's called a micro history. You know, I wanted to explore it the way that like a military history book or a sports history book or something like that explores it, where we're really, like you say, I'm immersing the readers in the setting, right? So it's it's not like it doesn't read like a textbook. You know, it reads like this just kind of beat by beat story. Yeah. And that was that was a terrible pun. I wasn't going for a pun. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's yeah, but um but yeah, that, that's kind of my background is I, I just love pop culture history and um, I still teach, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher to this day, but um, I'm a teacher that just can't handle doing only one thing. So fair. here we are. That's fair. I mean, yes. it's, um, and is this your first book? My first published book. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I mean, like you said, like you have taken this sort of this moment, if you will, that um has been touched upon in in various sort of snippets here and now i mean i i know the um 50 years of hip-hop documentary on netflix um and i'm myself i i'm more into the sort of like the origin dj side of things um mm. see behind me i got a couple of techniques and, and and all that um so i'm very much into the sort of like the scratch and um sort of like breaks and things like that uh when it comes to the djing side of things um and so I sort of, you know, I know that DJ side of things and recognize a lot of the names that you um, uh, mentioned in the book and that you've spoken to and things like that. You've got uh, Theodore, Grandmaster Theodore, um, Cool Herc, um, Grandmaster Flash, 
you know, all the sort of like names from back then that I instantly recognized. Um, yeah. The sort of like the rat MC side of thing. I'm not like, I'm going to say it now, I'm not like an OFA on the MCs. I've always been the part of the DJ side of it. And like the documentary that got me was Scratch. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, there's a documentary yeah. out about, I think it's about 10, maybe 15 years ago. Um, and that kind of like that dipped on the sort of like start of things as well. You know, like where the DJ came from and um you know how that was important to and then how the sort of split happened where the rappers went off one way and the djs kind of got left here the drum machines went with the rappers you know that sort of stuff and um you know and and, and i you know this 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 book like really it took me back to that because that that documentary really immersed me in that kind of style side of things as well because it took um took people back to that and and yeah i mean like you say like taking this moment that that was it was i know it was i think it was mentioned in 50 years um hip-hop documentary i believe um yes it was um sorry go ahead no no i was just gonna say because i remember i remember them mentioning harlem world and things like that, the club itself and um and, and sort of you know sort of like about that this particular night of which you write about i mean i don't want to give away too much because i want people to buy the book <laughs> you know um uh, which links in the description everyone um but yeah, yeah it's, it's um it, it for anyone that is into hip-hop obviously classic hip-hop as well as modern hip-hop just to know where that culture came from and just sort of the, the way that um like these battles that you talk about in the book um you know they're not like the sort of what, what we saw in like eight mile or you know the right um what we see on the television in some of those um reality or comedy shows where they have like the sort of you know back and forth um it was it was a whole thing it was a choreographed it was it was it was just a whole thing <laughs> it was a whole yeah. but it wasn't just one element it wasn't like the dj battles that you see as well like with dmc and things like that that kind of came out of that where you got like battling djs where they do a set um and some of them do you know go a step further but there's nothing else on top of that you know with this you had the mcs you had breaking dancing some you had graffiti going on in the background stuff like that as well with some of them and it was a whole thing it wasn't like this big sort of what's the word i'm looking for uh dismatch if you will you know or yeah. you know your mama off kind of thing <laughs> right you know the battles were um and i make this point really clear in the book that it was more like what you would think of as a talent show these days, where it yeah. was like yeah. each group, you know, and, and we're also in an era where um, hip hop is not in these like in the solo MC space yet. You know, these are six, five and six man groups that are heavily influenced by Motown. So, you know, we got the DJ and then five MCs or two DJs and four MCs. You know, it's like these are not like just a guy who's like spitting off the dome like so, you know these are like you say it's it's choreographed it's rehearsed and, and it wasn't about insulting the other group it was about just being better than them yeah. and then at the end of the night the audience would vote so you know you're you're spot on with that assessment you know eight mile is like what we think of as rap battles which is like let's insult the guy as much as we can and try to yeah. you know give him as many barbs as possible but yeah, no, back in the day, like that I'm talking about, that that culture hadn't evolved yet. Hip hop was very like sort of it was so new too. So it's just like how can we innovate? You know, who's gonna do the most innovative thing? Who's gonna push it further? Um, so that's kind of that's a big element that I touch on in the book with this battle culture is is really not prevalent until I mentioned in the last chapter, until about nineteen eighty two, the end of nineteen eighty two, where you have um Busy B and Cool Mo D have a um have a rap battle and uh, Busy B did the old timey thing, yeah. you know Busy B Starsky where he's just like you know trying to get the crowd to cheer and then um, Cool Mo D comes out and just destroys him, you know and just says like the meanest just most personal stuff, yeah um, and that kind of brought us into a new era but yeah but most of the book I'm talking about you know the battle culture is is six man groups doing their routines you know it's including dancing it's the djs doing tricks um you know the costumes are coordinated it's like a whole a whole production and it's like it's a contest rather than what i would call a battle yeah yeah no definitely definitely and um like i say like the the world you pull us into in there is 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 i can see this like like you know this either you know 
happy get all day television show movie you know this this moment could be encapsulated in that kind of style i feel of like watching these groups evolve watching them you know swap members as well that's another thing there were so many like i was reading through and i can't remember how many switchovers there are but you know a lot of these groups from uh the cold cash brothers um romantic fantastic romantic five and uh it was a grandmaster uh flash and furious things like that and th they're just trading members it's like a mad sports thing you know <laughs> right i mean the way that um the way it was explained to me by um charlie chase who's one of the djs for the cold crush brothers he said imagine if the beatles and the rolling stones you found out that Mick Jagger was originally the bass player for the Beatles, and that Paul McCartney started out as the lead singer for the Rolling Stones, and yeah. then at just some point before they got famous, they just switched it. Yeah. So um, part of this is just, remember, hip-hop is so young at this point. You know, we're talking about like 78, 79. Like, it's only been around, you know, for maybe half a decade, right? So there's just not a lot of people that are into it, not a lot of people that can DJ, not a lot of people that can, um, that can MC effectively. And um, I'm glad you mentioned earlier about the DJ, like the DJ at this time that we're talking about was the leader of the group, unquestionably, Yeah. because for a very simple reason, the DJ had the equipment. Yes. So he, it's very easy for the, you know, this is not a time where, you know, DJ setup was, was cheap. And these guys, you know, growing up in the Bronx, like they didn't have a lot. So you have, you know, if the DJ doesn't want you in the group, like you're not going to be in the group. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it, it's, I don't know, it just sort of, it felt like, um, you know, like, a, like they were trading, like it was literally like a sports team, you know, trading for this person, for that person, that person, and it just works out because it works out that, you know, they were making each other, or they, you know, I don't know if they were making each other stronger or not, but it was just sort of that kind of like community, if you will, at the time um, of, of yeah. hip hop or the sh streets in New York and things like that, because you had so many cultures rolling around in that area of, of 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 the states and you know and something was bound to come from it and i feel that hip-hop is it it was the you know it was it was all those cultures of like you know you had obviously uh puerto ricans you had a lot of like sort of i know some eastern european sort of side of things as well and obviously you know native Amer you know americans if you will and things like that just all in one place and this culture this this movement if you will came from that and obviously what we all know now is, you know, that was hip hop. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the one area you didn't mention was the Caribbean because you have yeah, um, a ton of, uh, a lot of, no, no, it's fine. It's just the Cari there's Caribbean um, culture that's kind of similar to hip hop in a way called dance hall. And, um, you know, DJ Cool Herc, for example, is a Jamaican immigrant. Grandmaster Flash, his family's from the Caribbean. Um, and back in the, in the Caribbean, it was totally normal to what's called toast the record. So you're playing the record at the party, you're playing the music, and then you get on the microphone and you're like, thank you so much for coming. I'm DJ, blah, blah, blah. You know, have, thanks for having a good time with me tonight. And like, that's very rudimentary, but eventually that evolves into emceeing, right? Um, and eventually, you know, the, just the playing the record doesn't become entertaining enough, right? Like eventually we discover what, or what Cool Herc discovered was, called the, well, I'm not going to give Cool Herc credit for this. I'm going to give Grandmaster Flash credit for this, although Cool Herc was um, experimenting with it. But you have what's called the merry-go-round, where you can, you know, put your hand on the vinyl and flip the record back to the what's called the break, the best part, right? So that you can go and basically replay that as long as you want to. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, obviously some of the best uh, early MCs from Puerto Rican, um, there were a lot of white people there too. There were a lot of, like you said, Eastern European people. Um, you know, it was a very diverse mix of cultures. And you're right, like New York is the place for this. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is that this is all young people. Hip hop is yeah. the youth's genre, the young person's genre, um, which is the reason all these early guys or most of these early guys are still with us. You know, like they they were like 16 when they were inventing hip hop. Yeah, um, which I, which I love. That's one of my favorite parts of the story. You know, just like the idea, like these kids are in high school, and then when the bell rings, they go back to one of their apartments, and they're you know coming up with a whole new musical genre. Yeah, no, it's 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 amazing. Like, and I've I've been fortunate enough to meet some of these people uh, from back then. I, I met briefly Grandmaster Flash about 
it was about 10 years ago got to ask him one question um <laughs> and he just like let me just gave me one piece of wisdom that that that, that really kind of set me off it was like well it wasn't set me off i was already djing but it was just like you know it, basically his advice was try everything like when it comes to music try everything like he would he would play yeah. you know, he would try rock he would try rap he would try you know dance he would try you know jazz he would try stuff like that you know and he said just until you find something and you will find something but you just try everything you know and he, and, and just from the djing point of view yeah it's amazing for me because i i mean i predominantly dj rock music that's my main thing i was a radio dj um i dj nightclubs here uh rock clubs if you will which is totally sort of other worst yeah. end of it because you know there's a lot of crossover between them but you're right about the sort of like when the dj sort of you know just playing the record wasn't enough just sort of you know introducing yourself and saying goodbye at the end of it wasn't enough you've got to be able to be vocal on that microphone and you can have people there with you you know you can have the you know that side of it but i found that you know being a dj in this crowd you need to sort of you need that energy as well you need to show people that energy so they keep going um and yeah, no, I mean, it's sort of back to your book. <laughs> um, um, you sort of you go on about this night at Harlem World, uh, which is a, a club um, in New York, was a club, I should say, in New York. Um, I believe now it's a, is it a department store, clothing store or something now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, go on. So super, super funky. So, no. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Harlem World is a, um, or it was a really interesting place. It opened in 1978, and the the vision of the people backing it were, was to make this just, I, I'm, I'm going to rewind just a quick second. Yeah, okay. First of all, back then, the word hip-hop wasn't used a lot. The word disco was used a lot. And hip-hop is just kind of an offshoot of disco, so you kind of hear them interchangeably at that point. But yeah, so Harlem World is opening in 1978, and it's like going to be this bastion of disco you know like this like three-story nightclub with a hundred foot bar with a you know capacity of a thousand people it had like little apartments upstairs for the people that worked at the place so they never had to leave so you know there was the harlem world crew um and you know this, the, the origin story behind it's interesting you know the, the idea was this guy that went by fat man and fat man was a well-known uh criminal and so he had like other people basically, you know, front for it, say like people who ran construction companies and stuff say like, oh, you know, this is going to bring jobs to the city. And, and, you know, that's how they got it built. Um, and there was actually also a complaint from the mosque across the street saying like, this is going to be a noise thing. Like we're, you know, it's going to be annoying to the neighborhood. And so they, they called it the Harlem World Cultural Center. Like, oh. to basically make it like oh you know we're gonna do community events and we're gonna do like youth classes and all this stuff but it was a nightclub and they partied seven days a week and and what happened was it became this kind of show place for hip-hop in new york so you know remember hip-hop is um a diy genre you don't need a club to do hip-hop you can as long as you're capable of getting out to a basketball court in a park or you have a you know space in the lobby of your building or whatever, right? You don't you don't necessarily need to be at a club to throw a party, but it became sort of this the show place where people, if you're good enough, you can play at Harlem World. Kind of like I use the comparison like loosely, but kind of what the Grand Ole Opry is for country music, right? Where it's like not everyone can play there. Harlem World was sort of the, the big nightclub in New York, the big, you know, the big sort of uh, testing ground. Yeah. So by the time you get to 1981, which is when my book mostly takes place, um, you know, people who are giving parties at Harlem World are sort of the cream of the crop. You have um, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, the Funky Four Plus One More, Curtis Blow. Um, you know, these are sort of the first hip hop acts that even began to like touch the mainstream. But the problem is, or not the problem, I guess the sort of the, the the interesting crux of my book here is that Flash and the Furious Five and the Funky Four Plus One More went on tour. Mm -hmm. And that opened up this wide, like, sort of gap in the city. Like, who's the best hip-hop crew in New York in this original underground scene? And that's kind of where you get to this battle between Fantastic and Cult Crush. 
Um, and Harlem World was the only place where it was going to take place because, you know, you can have people come in from all the all the boroughs. It was easy to get to. There was a subway station a one minute walk away. Um, and you don't have the biggest capacity of any of these clubs. You know, a thousand people, it, a thousand people was easy for them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's one of those, like, I, I'd, I'd heard the name uh, of the club before, um, obviously in the various sort of like documentary side of, you know, DJ history that I do have in my brain, um, that place was mentioned, uh, a few times and it, it was like, it was the, then the pinnacle, it was like, you know, it was the, it was the Friday night, the Apollo, it was the, you know, it was the, uh, what we have here is, you know, Wembley or something like that, you know, the big venues here. Yeah. Um, not obviously you know in, in that sort of scale like if, you know, i used to have a venue i always wanted to play you know back in the day and and you know eventually you know you get there <laughs> um, um but some, right. a lot of people that didn't well, but, so um yeah but also remember and remember the scale is so small because hip-hop yeah. in this form that we're talking about is still an underground like you have to hear about it from someone you have to get a flyer in your hand you know what i mean it's not like at and at the same time, some hip hop is starting to take off, um, but not the stuff that we're talking about. You know, not this like these five six man groups, the original, you know, as it's sort of meant to be hip hop. Yeah, 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 yeah. You you things like the message and stuff. I think were out around then, wasn't it? And uh, those were the sort of things breaking sort of mainstream side of things. But it was still disco. It was still funk. You know that they're pulling yeah. breaks from and stuff like that. And and. Yeah, it was um obviously you know this this night that you're talking about it was just kind of a um a winner take all if you will a thousand dollars which it's a lot of money today as well <laughs> so um, <laughs> but back then it's it's worth even more but um yeah you set like these two groups that that kind of go up against each other for this prize um yeah. and you know I, I don't wanna, I don't know if I can give away the winners or not on this but. <laughs> I don't know people... no, please do please, no, please do because it's a uh, you know actually i'll i'll give just a tiny bit more background you know the the part of the book that or the part of the battle that's interesting is the groups have contrasting styles so yeah um cold crush was much more centered around um their lyricism so they have like grandmaster kaz who is i would say the first like great poet mc if that makes sense the first the first guy that took rhyming to like do a narrative story to do something meaningful yeah. Um, and so you have him leading Cold Crush, and they're doing all kinds of interesting things with using rock music as the under the underbelly, the breaks. Um, and then you have Fantastic, and they're much more of a Motown influence kind of group. They, you know, they wanted to be the Temptations or Gladys Knight and the Pips, and they, you know, they had dance moves, and they were playing a lot of like music that was on the radio, a lot of like Michael Jackson things like that. And, yeah. and they, um, and they were led by Grand Wizard Theodore, you know, who's who's the much more known DJ. So what you have is, and this is why it's kind of an important moment in hip hop. You have a group that is kind of embracing this sort of lyric first, MC first approach. And then you have a group that is doing things with the more traditional, like dance first, you know, throw a party, say some rhymes and the DJ will get everyone to go crazy. Um, and if I can spoil it, I mean, cause this is, this is kind of an important piece of the book um fantastic did win yeah. they won that night but and this and i'm not going to spoil this part but that was only the beginning of the conversation surrounding the battle yes yes definitely. so the fantastic five won yeah fantastic five won yeah yeah i mean i was i, would, I didn't want to go into too much detail on that because it's like almost the pinnacle of everything but yeah I mean, the fantastic um is it fantastic romantic five isn't it um fantastic romantic five it's a real tongue twister uh, <laughs> um, um but yeah they they won um and you know they did uh, a shorter a performance as well um and they kind of you know obviously won the crowd in the building uh because that's how it was it was voted it was you know these guys this guy is give a cheer for these guys and then bang you know um <laughs> which is a classic old school way of deciding any kind of like, you know, um, competition, if you will, in any kind. It's like the audience vote on, uh, you know, American talent, or whatever, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it was like there and then, I mean, it, it's one of those things where, you know, you know, 
I would love to have been there. Your book takes me a step close to that. Um, you know, your book is it's very like your writing style, like I say, it's it's immersive. Um, it's very like it put images in my head, which doesn't happen too often with books, I'm gonna be honest with you, because this is the sort of the first time I've had like a full time, like a full on author on my show, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I've had various DJs, various musicians, various of uh comedians, stuff like that, but um like having like having pre having like rather than listening to music before an interview <laughs> and sort of you know mm-hmm. listening to that it was really good to put, which you know yeah. it, it's good for me because i need to read more books my wife keeps telling me i need to read them um but yeah no this one it really like I, my head was buried in it for a good few days and 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 like i say it, it took me your, your style is amazing like i feel like i say with that I keep using the same words immersive it, it took me there it took me there the only the only thing i was missing was the smells you know, it was like in my head, yeah. I, can, I can visually see, <laughs> I can hear this beat in the, in the, in the distance, you know, when you're talking about where these like parties were at and people were like following the sound and stuff like that to these places. Um, and it's sort of, you know, it made me want to go to, I've, I've, I've not been to New York and I might, you know, I do want to go there. So I know it's not the same, but you know, I do want to go there at some point. I used to live in the States, but I never made it to New York. Um, so mm um but yeah i like everyone go buy the book um it is absolutely brilliant um it's called harlem world it's right here i've got it in my hand here it's available on well amazon i think is probably gonna be your best bet here um for that um i think i'll put the links in the description so if you can buy a link i'll put one for the us as well because we do have us listeners and stuff like that so uh it's harlem world how hip-hop's super showdown change music forever um jonathan i've got a couple of questions left for you if that's all right then i'll let you get on with the rest of your day if that's okay um absolutely go ahead so uh first question um do you have any upcoming projects after this are you working on anything around that or? yeah i mean i have a few I have a few things in the pipeline, um, but I can't I can't tell you anything's close to being done. I think right, right now we're focusing on getting the audiobook for this out because um, you know that's a main way that people consume their books nowadays. So yeah. we're definitely working on that. Um, and then I you know I have a couple ideas up my sleeves, but uh, right now I'm just sort of kind of in that you know post book kind of like taking a breath. Yes, you know <laughs> like you know. You know, it's like I don't want to have like um, Irish twin books. You know, like I don't want them to come yeah. out right on, right back to back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, but you, you'll hear from me again. I promise. Cool. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So, um, another question I got for you. Um, I usually ask my guests uh, their three most pivotal albums in their life. So, not necessarily the favorite albums. You know, I, I don't always go for you know, your top five albums, but if you could pinpoint three albums that really made a difference in your life, or even just three songs, like when you heard it, or yeah inspired you to you know to write this book to do what you do anything like that in your life absolutely um it's not expecting this so just give me a second so i don't trip all over myself in doing this that's all right <laughs> all right cool all right so um you're gonna be surprised they're all from different genres oh, that's good. so yeah from under the cork tree fallout boy cool yeah um, that came out when i was in middle school and it was just like you know important yeah. super important um illmatic by nas which was the um first rap album i ever fell in love with and then um kind of a recent one i'm going to give a shout out to um 100 gex uh 1000 gex by 100 gex yes and um yeah and i don't know how i didn't mean for this to be a plug for 100 gex but um they've kind of made me like fall in love with the idea of like music you can still make new genres of music you know music's not a uh that music's not static like sometimes people complain it is like oh nothing new's coming out yeah so i have to give them a shout out but yeah, yeah i'm gonna go from under the cork tree illmatic thousand gex honorable mention goes to american idiot um because okay. that's a pretty close one too. yeah yep excellent i mean they're all good choice. i mean it's the first time of anyone i've heard anyone mention 100 gex <laughs> this is great because <laughs> i love that band i like i i found their most recent album. i ain't gotten some recently but i found the most recent album yeah um pop up at my local record shop actually it's the beauty of independent record stores we still have them here just just um but they were playing it and the thing oh, what the hell is this you know like, what, what and yep. yeah like i went home um and and i've had them they're on my playlists and everything um which is great and, i could do a full i could do a full three hour episode with you just about 100 guests but well, um yeah i'm gonna try and get them. at some point 
um but yeah no since i've discovered them it's it's been great and i've like you know it's sort of it, you're right it's sort of you didn't know anything else could be done at some points because being in music you just hear a lot of the same thing or you hear the same thing come back around again you know like we've got like you've mentioned fallout boy and things like that we've had the sort of like that emo movement or post hardcore movement come back yeah. around and we're just getting onto new metal again which is kind of my area of you know i was right. a, i was a scratch dj in a metal band so you know <laughs> very much into the new metal sign of things um but yeah obviously um nas fantastic um fantastic album. oh yeah um but yeah um final question for you john and i'll let you get on with the rest of your day right i promise um what are your hobbies away from this so if you're not writing or teaching um what what are your sort of hobbies yeah well i love to make donuts i'm a very skilled donut maker nice yeah. love that um i also love to this is i mean it's not really a hobby when you love pop culture as much as i do but i just i love like um uh, listening to new music finding new music um going to concerts you know always just kind of looking for that next thing that's going to spark my taste to go in a different direction you know i have a very um and i think and i think you do too like i think it's so important to have an eclectic taste in music you know like there's never been like okay honestly there's there's very few bands even the ones that people make fun of that i say like oh i'll never listen to that if that makes sense you know i just i, I try to keep my musical palette wide open um and you know this is gonna sound lame but just hanging out with my mom <laughs> like okay. i have the coolest mom and so we just hang out all the time yeah no that's fair that's fair well jonathan yeah oh and yeah. oh and, for, and wait wait one more thing and for yeah. my uk listeners by the way for the uk people yeah. i have really gotten into the premier league lately it's how i start my weekend okay. day so you know that's a that's a thing i'm into lately are, yeah. you, are you following anyone in particular you know, I, like in the U.S., you, you know, like you kind of just get the games that are on TV. But I do, I will say, like my favorite team to watch is Tottenham. Okay, I really enjoy them. Nice, nice. Yeah, cool. yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, I'm yeah. a, I mean, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, but cool. No, Jonathan, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate your time. Um, I hope the rest of your day goes okay. Um, I hope the book is doing well for you as well because I know it's out now. So. Again, we're going to plug it again. This one is Harlem World. Uh, now, here, how hip hop's Super Showdown changed music forever by Jonathan Mao, the gentleman just here. Um, and yeah, um, I'll put links in the bio uh, to some Amazon bookstores. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully people will pick it up for you and everything and uh, enjoy it as much as I did. I really appreciate your time, Barnaby. Thank you so much for having me on. And yeah, start and start reading more. Listen to your wife. Read. Yeah, I will. I will. I promise. <laughs> I promise. Cool. Well, yeah, John. Thank you, um, though. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a good rest of your day, mate. All right. You as well.